the evidence is the Prophet وسلم, walking and saying, had it not been for the women and children in the house, I would have collected firewood and burned down the homes of the men staying back from the congregational prayer. That hadith in Sahih al jamia is the proof. That's the proof. You must pray in jama'ah. I don't care if you have small Mumayyah's children, seven, eight years old, they fit the hukum, that is jama'ah. Abu al-Wafa ibn Aqim went one step further. He said, if you do not pray your five times salawat in congregation in the masjid, your salah is not valid. That's how strict he was. Your salah is not valid. Now that is a minority position, and he was condemned politely, but it's understood because he lived next door to a masjid. <laughs> but look at how he viewed salah. Look at how important he saw it. If your salah has not been prayed in congregation, and this has not been done, and that, and then they said, well, wait a minute, hold on. If you say that, that the salah is not valid except in congregation inside of the masjid, and his salah isn't valid outside of that, what if he misses it? What's the hukum on him? He said, don't ask me that. Because you know what's coming next. That's how serious Abu Wafa ibn Aqil took matters. A very wonderful alim. He wrote a book on usul al-fiqh. Very lengthy. One on fiqh that was very lengthy. Al-Wadih, if memory serves me correct. Al-Wadih, which deals with fiqh and usul al-fiqh matters. He also held the strict position that no one should be going to visit the graves or the shrines except to give salam because you will disturb the dead and annoy them and it's haram to annoy the Muslims. So he took this position. So the people that go and they visit the graves excessively, it's haram because they're annoying the dead. Not because it should, because you're annoying the dead. They're dead, they have peace now. Let your parents rest. Right? They've escaped from you now. Now it's your time to move on. Let your parents rest. Right? That's his position that he had, is that the dead had to have a right to rest and to enjoy the blessings that are in the grave. 514 to 561 AH. All right, the events that occurred in this time, uh, there were observatories in the Muslim world. There were 70 hospitals in Baghdad. The doctors there had emergency rooms and also bedding for their patients, drips controlled by vacuum seals. Most medicines later used in Europe and the United States were invented. Also, Muslims used vaccinations that involved protecting the Muslim people from what seemed like the creeping catastrophe of the Black Death. If you want to know why the Black Death didn't ravage the Muslim world, it's because we had vaccinations. That's why. That's why. Part of the reason for the spread of the Black Death that Muslim scholars found is from the transmission of it by rats. Because the Kufar were, and some may even today, were eating rats. And it was transmitting the disease by their consumption of them and living next to them and bad sanitary conditions and not washing their hands after using the toilet, you know, like how it is now. That was the reason for the spread of the Black Death. And so the ulama stopped this. The year 523 AH saw 6,000 people killed in Damascus due to refusal to submit to the Ismaili religion. They entered into the city with great fanfare and the Hashishiyun were still strong. An attempt was made upon explorer Marco Polo's life by this group. Marco Polo was the one that returned to Europe from China and the Muslim world and said that he found observatories and hospitals and they, at first he was sectioned in an asylum because he said this man's gone insane. There is no way people outside of Europe have that type of advanced civilization. This man's clearly insane. The only thing that kept him from being detained for life is they found noodles in his bag and pasta. And they thought, well, where did he get these from? Because those people didn't eat. Now we take it for granted. But back then, noodles, that was considered ethnic. What was he doing with noodles in his bag? And so they found noodles and macaroons and other strange exotic foods. And they said, maybe there's some truth to what he's saying. Maybe the old man hasn't gone crazy yet. So if you read about Marco Polo, what he went through, not through his travels, he was treated well. If you read about what his people did to him upon return, after he explained to them what he saw, you will understand better the mind of the people that we're dealing with. Many children were killed by flying scorpions in the year 524 AH in Baghdad, while Ibn Tumart, the false Mahdi, died the same year after causing great tribulations. 
Members of the Batiniya cult were able to storm past security and murder the Khalifa al-Mustarshid Billah. Thursday, the 15th of Dhul Qa'da, 529 AH, but they were promptly killed thereafter. The son of al-Mustarshid, al-Rashid, took control of the Khilafah and became the 30th Abbasid Khalifa. While some of the people of Halab tried to resist Frankish control in 530 AH, the Khalifa al-Rashid had consistent problems with his security forces, and particularly the head of his military. He was deposed in 530 AH when after a quarrel with a sultan named Mas'ud, he left the city, and the army was divided into two parties. The Khalifa had gone to Al Mosul, and the Sultan came into the palace of the, of the Khalifa and then called the scholars of fiqh, and a letter was produced from the deceased Al Murshid that whoever should leave Baghdad to fight with the Sultan will have self abdicated himself from the Khilafah. When the scholars of fiqh saw this, there were some of them that gave the fatwa that Al Rashid had been deposed. The Khalifa Al Rashid, as a side point, died in 532. H. Now the now the abdication of Al Rashid took place on Monday, the 16th of the Qa'da, by the rule of the judge and fatwa of the scholars of fiqh. He was succeeded by Al Muqtafi, the son of Al Mustadhar Billah, the 31st Khalifa of the Abbasid system. He defended Baghdad from numerous attacks and showed great valor, but was not able to devote the majority of his time to stopping the Crusaders. A war was raging between him and the Turks that was still that, that many of whom were still worshipping idols in 536 AH. Much of this war sapped his resources and gave him great difficulties to the point to where he had to dedicate more time to that than to the Crusaders. In the year 541 AH, the Franks took part of North Africa and held on to it for some years. Nuruddin Mahmoud ibn Zenki conquered three large fortresses of the Franks at Halab. So you start to see that the Muslims are coming back against the Franks. They're starting to gather their forces. And the one responsible for that was Nuruddin. I want to mention something very quickly that I think you find as part of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's way very interesting. Imam ibn al Jawzi, rahimahullah, who died 597 AH, one of the top students of Sheikh Abdul Qadir al Jilani, he said, there is something I want, he said, quote, there's something I want to tell you that I think is important. And it's a very amazing. If you look very carefully, every sixth ruler of the Muslims since the time of Islam is always deposed. Think very carefully. And I will show you what I have found. The situation happened after the time of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu Then came Abu Bakr. Omar, Uthman, Ali, and Al-Hasan, who self-abdicated. Then after that came Muawiyah, Yazid ibn Muawiyah, Muawiyah ibn Yazid, Marwan, then Abdul, Abdul Malik, and, Abd, and Ibn al-Zubayr, who was forcibly abdicated and killed, and was number six in the line. Then, later than that, came as safah from the Abbasids, then Al-Mansur, then Al-Mahdi, then Al-Hadi, then Al-Rashid, then Al-Amin, and he was deposed, the sixth of them, and killed. Then came Al-Ma'moon, Al-Mu'tasim, Al-Wathiq, Al-Mutawakkil, Al-Muntasir, Al-Musta'een. And Al-Musta'een was deposed, the sixth of them, and he was killed. Then came Al-Mu'taz, then Al-Muqtadi, then Al-Mu'tamid, then Al-Mu'tadid, then Al-Muqtafi, then Al-Muqtadir. Then he was deposed. He tried to come back, then he was killed. Then the next six came Al-Qahir, Al-Radi, Al-Muttaqi, Al-Mustakfi, Al-Muti'a, Al-Ta'i, and he was deposed. Then came the next six, Al-Qadir, Al-Qa'im, Al-Muqtadi, Al-Mustadhar, Al-Mustarshid, Al-Rashid. Then he was deposed, and then Al-Muqtafi came in. So it's very interesting that you see that every six Khulafa, one of them gets deposed and removed from power. Either he self-abdicates, or he's removed from power and killed, or he's removed from power and another Khalifa is put in his place. At the onset of 542 AH, the Franks came down and forced out the inhabitants of Damascus and there was great fighting. The Muslims at first had their masjids, women, and property violated, but then they fought back and the Crusaders were driven from Damascus with great loss of life on both sides. Al-Muqtafi, la Amirillah, died in 555 AH 
and the 32nd Khalifa coming to power was Al-Mustanjid, the son of Al-Muqtafi. The great Mujahid Nuruddin was in battle fighting the Franks who were trying to take Homs again in the year 558 AH. 559 AH saw some of the worst fighting shift to Egypt where another great general was coming into his own. His name was Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi. In 560 AH, Damascus was handed over to Salah al-Din by Nur al-Din in order for him to administrate it. Nur al-Din had done so much fighting he was becoming weary and Salah al-Din and his troops were fresher. Nur al-Din took more fortresses from the Crusaders in this year and also the Shia grew in strength in Baghdad and began giving distorted khutbahs and lectures in Baghdad. All right, so this is some of what was going on. Now, some of the deaths in this time include Abdul Rahim al Qushayri, who was the son of Imam al Qasim al Qushayri. He was a great Ashari debater and orator. He died in 514 AH. Imam Muhammad ibn Ahmed ibn Rushd al Maliki and Abu Bakr al Tarpushi, both Imams of Andalus, who died in the year 520 AH. You also have Imam ibn al Zaghuni who died in 527 A.H. Abu Qasim Jarullah Mahmoud ibn Umar ibn Muhammad al-Zamakhshari, who died in 538 A.H. He was one of the remaining Mu'tazila of the Hanafis. Now, Zamakhshari is significant because his Arabic was seen as immaculate. But the Arabic was in his commentary called Al-Kashaf, which is his commentary on the Qur'an where he assiduously tries to prove throughout his pages that the Qur'an is created. That ahad hadith are invalid for use in the creed. And that Allah won't be seen in the hereafter. And that salvation is by faith and deeds. Bizarrely enough, you will sometimes find this text being taught by some scholars at al-Azhar and at some Hanafi institutions today. This is a big fitna for the scholars of the Hanafi school. And they've got to stop it. And the best way is just by removing these from the library because there's so many other Arabic books that are written by Hanafi scholars that are pure of this. There's no need to have Zamakhshari there. And there are so many distortions that Zamakhshari has. There's no need to use him. What need is there to use a dirty fork or drink from a glass with black dye in it when you have one with water. Sure, the starving man will eat anything. But if you have a choice besides crackers, you should eat it. Now also those in that time who died, Imam Ahmed ibn Qudama, the great scholar and patriarch of the Banu Qudama clan in 558 AH. He is the father of Imam Muwafiq al-Din ibn Qudama, Imam Shams al-Din ibn Qudama, Imam Abu Umar ibn Qudama, Imam Ibn al-Imad ibn Qudama, Imam Najmuddin ibn Qudama. He is the patriarch and ancestor of the Banu Qudama. Honestly, I say sometimes to myself, SubhanAllah, look at all of what the Palestinians have given us. And look at what we've given them. The whole Banu Qudama clan, Imam Muwafiq al-Din, all of his brothers, Palestinians. Abdul Ghani ibn Abdul Wahid al-Maqdisi, Palestinian. Ibn Muflih, the great Shami scholar who we've mentioned numerous times, Palestinian. Ibn al liham Palestinian. Ibn Qundus, Palestinian. So many of these scholars, Abdullah al Qudumi, Palestinian. Mar ibn Yusuf al Karmi, Palestinian. The whole Qudumi family, Palestinians. So many of these people, Abdul Ghani and Nabulsi, the great Hanafi scholar, Palestinian. The Palestinians have a pension for ilm. And when you see the Palestinians, there are no hot or cold, there, there, there are no lukewarm Palestinians. When Palestinians are right, they're strong upon this religion. And when they are wrong, they go headlong into it. There are no lukewarm Palestinians. When you see them, they're either like this, strong like Imam Muafiq al-Din and the others, or they're secular like Black September and the PLO and all these other groups, the Palestinian Authority, they're secular. They're either strong in deen or they're strong in dunya. There's never any in between. Now for these people, you find Imam Abdul Qadir al-Jilani, rahimahullah, he died in 561 AH. And he left his knowledge to his successors or his khulafah. 